series, we're focusing on supraventricle tachyarrhythmias, meaning tachyarrhythmias or fast rhythms, which originate above the ventricle, hence supraventricular. This is in contrast to, for example, ventricular tachycardias, which may originate from a foci within the ventricle. Examples of supraventricular tachycardias include sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, multifocal atrial tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. However, for the purposes of this module, we're going to focus on atrial fibrillation. Most commonly, our patients with atrial fibrillation are going to be asymptomatic. However, if they do become symptomatic, they may present with palpitations, shortness of breath, chest pain, dizziness, and fatigue. Additionally, these patients may present in the context of congestive heart failure, cardiogenic shock, or cerebrovascular accidents, such as strokes or TIAs. When it comes to patients with atrial fibrillation, we can divide them into categories based on the persistence of their symptoms. We have, for example, patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in which their abnormal rhythm will terminate spontaneously within seven days of onset. In contrast, we have patients with what we call persistent AFib in which their abnormal rhythm fails to self-resolve within seven days of onset. Additionally, we have patients who we categorize as having long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation in which their abnormal rhythm has lasted for more than 12 months. And lastly, we have patients with so-called permanent atrial fibrillation in which the clinical decision has been made to no longer pursue rhythm control. We'll see examples of rhythm control later on in this module, for example, cardiac ablation therapy. However, once we have a patient with permanent atrial fibrillation, we have essentially determined that these measures are no longer going to be effective and that this patient will have this rhythm permanently. As we mentioned at the start of this module, atrial fibrillation is an example of a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, and therefore this is going to originate from an ectopic foci that is located above the ventricle. In particular, for atrial fibrillation, the most common location of origination of this abnormal rhythm is going to be the pulmonary veins. These pulmonary veins are located at this point here in this schematic on the right-hand side of the presentation, and therefore in AFib, our rhythm is going to originate from these pulmonary veins rather than from the sinoatrial node, which is what we would see in a normal patient. These ectopic foci located in the pulmonary veins are the basis for catheter ablation therapy in which we can ablate this abnormal ectopic foci coming from the pulmonary veins. Because of the electrical activity that is coming from these pulmonary veins, this is ultimately going to lead to disorganized atrial activity, which is ultimately going to manifest as an absence of P waves on our EKG. And this is highly characteristic for atrial fibrillation. There are several medical conditions that can tip patients off and essentially put them into acute atrial fibrillation. These include pulmonary disease, myocardial ischemia, rheumatic heart disease, anemia, atrial myxomas, thyroid disease, including hyper and hypothyroidism, alcoholism, as well as sepsis. And this is something that we can monitor for our patients in the hospital when they're on telemetry in order to see if they are essentially going into AFib. And recognizing this early is extremely important, as we will later see when it comes to managing these patients. As we mentioned previously, our patients with atrial fibrillation are classically going to have an absence of distinct P waves on their EKG. Normally, we would expect our patients to have distinct P waves before each QRS. However, as we can clearly see in this EKG, there simply are not distinct P waves prior to each QRS. Additionally, on EKG, especially in the rhythms that you will see on your USMLE and shelf examinations, it should be extremely clear that these patients have an irregularly irregular rhythm. This could also be appreciated in how these QRS complexes are spaced in an irregularly irregular manner. And generally, this is most easily seen in the QRS, as when we look at one of these QRX complexes, it is simply impossible for us to predict when the next QRS complex is going to occur. And this is highly characteristic of atrial fibrillation. Therefore, in terms of diagnosis and workup of our patients with atrial fibrillation, we're going to, of course, get an EKG and see this irregularly irregular rhythm. Additionally, we should also get a TSH as well as a T4, because as we stated previously, in terms of risk factors that could tip off atrial fibrillation, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism are very high on that list. Additionally, we should perform risk stratification for stroke. We do this using the CHADS2 VAS score. And ultimately, as we will see moving forward, this is going to help us determine whether our patients need anticoagulation therapy. As you can see from this table, in determining the CHADS2 VAS score, a patient is going to receive one point for most criteria in this system. However, there are two criteria for this A here, as well as this S here, for which the patient will receive two points in their CHADS2 VAS score. Therefore, just to go through all of these criteria briefly, if the patient has congestive heart failure, that will give them one point on the CHADS2 VAS score. If they have hypertension, this will give them one point. If they have age greater than or equal to 75, this will give them two points. If the patient has diabetes, this will give them one point. If the patient has a stroke, a transient ischemic attack, or a thromboembolism, this will give them two points. This is not surprising because the CHADS2 VAS score is essentially giving them a score in terms of their risk of developing a stroke. 
And therefore, if they have had one of these events in the past, it is not surprising that they are at additional risk for the development of these in the future. Additionally, having vascular disease, such as a prior myocardial infarction or peripheral arterial disease, will give them an additional point. Being between the age of 65 and 74 will give our patient a point. And additionally, the final category is sex category.